From the Aleuts at Kizar to the glory days at the stick. From who's got it better than us to brick by brick. It's always the 49ers way from off season to game day. Yeah, we talk back. It's the 49ers cut back. It's 49ers Cutback Podcast time, and we're diving deep into the draft. And we're going to start with our position breakdowns of our top five list of all the positions. But today, the main one, the signal caller. I'm sure everyone of the 49ers is interested in this because this is a big offseason question horse. What do you think about this position that we're going to go with the quarterbacks? I think this is an extremely talented, top heavy group of quarterbacks. There's a couple guys in there that most people think of can't miss prospects, and some people think there's four to five can't miss prospects in there. So it's gonna the draft is gonna be really interesting. I think this year it's it always is a little bit, but this year the draft is really gonna be centered around quarterbacks. Oh yeah, big time centered around quarterbacks. We try not to be too centered around quarterbacks on the podcast, but you know every every now and again. You got to talk about the quarterback position, especially for the 49ers, because it's a big question of concern. So we're going to start off this whole thing with the quarterback discussion, get it out of the way so that we can get into a little bit more of the juicier stuff and some of the other position players later. But before we get st- exactly, before we get started, you need to hit that subscribe button right now at this very moment. We're getting so close to 500 subscribers. The subscriber count has been shooting through the roof. Join, be a part of the community, be a part of the 49er Cutback Podcast community right now. Hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, like the video, all the good stuff so we can get into this. Because now that you have, we get to rank these quarterbacks, our mock draft sort of rankings, our pre-draft rankings. How are we feeling about these guys? Yeah, these rankings are, I mean, I guess everyone has an opinion. And when you break down the film, everyone's going to see it a different way. And also, you know, how these guys are going to uh, develop in the NFL depends on what team they go to and what system they're in. And we're going to we're going to go through, you know, which guys are in our top fives. But then we're going to tell you which ones make the most sense for the 49ers. So that way you're not just getting a top five list. You can get that elsewhere. But here you're going to get the top five and then what those guys can mean for the 49ers. So don't leave the episode early. Make sure you pay attention so you get these top fives. And let's get it started, Mr. Alex. Let's start with you. Your top five quarterbacks in the NFL draft. All right, we'll, we'll start. I think all of us are going to go reverse order. We're going to start with five, right. and then the big reveal, which I don't think is too much of a reveal for anybody. I, I have a feeling. Let, let's hope not. I have a tingling feeling about this. Um, starting I don't off, know about your tingling. Not, no one wants to know about the tingling. <laughs> for me, it's number five. Quarterback number five on my big board is Mr. Trey Lance. Okay, Mr. Trey Lance from North Dakota State University. Uh, he's a big guy. Um, the measurables are there. I don't want to talk a whole lot about the measurables with the guys. Uh, six six three six four ish guy, two hundred twenty one pound redshirt sophomore. Didn't really have a whole lot of game film this year. Only nope. played one game, so there's really nothing to go on other than his twenty nineteen stats, which were fairly impressive. For me, the big things though, fourteen and a half yards per completion. Okay, ranks third amongst the the guys in the top five that we have ranked, or at least my top five anyway. Um, he's arguably one of the best dual threat quarterbacks in the draft. I think the other guy that a lot of names get thrown out is a guy like Justin Fields. Um, Zach Wilson uh, obviously doesn't get touted as too much of a dual threat guy, but he is quite impressive as well. Right. But Trey Lance, arguably one of the better guys. Arm talent is definitely not a concern with this guy. He does make a lot of risky throws, but as you can see there from the graphic, zero interceptions. Doesn't turn the ball over a whole heck of a lot. Uh, projected 465, 40 time is what I've been looking at, is what a lot of gig people haven't pegged at. Um, level of competition is the big concern for Trey Lance guys he played against, etc. The, the type of competition he played against, you're not seeing elite competition, so therefore it's really hard to gauge where he's at. He doesn't get a senior bowl test either, so you don't get to see him against some of the other better players in college football that are seniors. Um, he's got a little bit of an elongated throwing motion, winds up a little bit to make the throw, uh, and then inconsistent footwork and some of the decision-making issues. He does have some throws that he shouldn't make that didn't end up in turnovers and interceptions in college, which probably will end up as turnovers in the in the NFL um, so he's number five on my board number four is a guy a lot of people are familiar with quite an impressive young man it's Mac Jones 
Mac Jones from Alabama. Um, obviously storied storied career this year, this season. He's a guy who's been through the ringer, sat behind Tua, sat behind Jalen. He's been waiting for his time to shine, and it's it was finally here this year. It was on full display. He was an absolute monster. 76 percent completion percentage in his only year as a starter in college football was his, which is absolutely phenomenal a high 70 percent completion percentage it's great you love to see that kind of stuff in my opinion second best court pocket quarterback passer in the draft next to trevor lawrence um it's a and then b um he's not too far behind in, in the pocket passer category in terms of being able to be comfortable in the pocket feel the pocket out he does have some concerns he is a little bit stationary He's not as he's not as mobile as he probably should be, but when you're playing behind that Alabama offensive line, you don't really have to be. It looks like Josh Allen sometimes back there. He just plants his feet and doesn't move. When you're that comfortable in the pocket, you can you can be that way. Um, he can distribute the ball and make solid decisions with the ball to a variety of people. He's not a he's not a one read guy. He's not someone who's going to lock in on one guy for the entirety of a of a drive or on any single drop back. He can progress through and make reads, which you'll love to see. Uh, projected 488 dash, uh, 62, uh, uh, yeah, 6263 guy, about just over 205 pounds, somewhere in there is where his measurables have been listed at. Um, mobility is obviously a concern with Mac Jones. May not be capable of taking risks as a quarterback. We did see a lot of deep ball throws this year, but when you got the guys on the outside like Jalen Wall, yeah. Devontae Smith, it's easy to make those throws. He doesn't take a lot of shots other to guys than that, so he may not be someone who takes risks at the next level. Um, the big question for me though is, does he elevate talent around him or is he elevated by talent? Because it's really easy to be as successful as Mac Jones was when you're playing for Alabama. The big question and concern is, in one year of tape, with only one year of, of experience under his belt, was he that good because of who he played with or did he make those people that much better? Is Devontae Smith a Heisman Trophy candidate because Mac Jones is his quarterback? Or is Mac Jones playing as well as he is because Devontae Smith is a high trophy winner? Big questions going into this draft. A lot of questions that need to get answered. And not a lot of time and ways for him to be able to show that, especially with the changes to the combine. Number three on my big board, Justin Field from Ohio State. Might surprise some of you, but there are some concerns with Justin Fields. The big thing, though, for me is with Mr. Fields, the, the positives. Okay, Mid 60 to 70% completion percentage for the entirety of his career stemming from Georgia all the way now to Ohio State. Only six interceptions in 19 career games. That's a plus. That's a definite positive. It was one of the things that this year, I watched that Indiana game, a lot of people watched the Indiana game in which he threw three interceptions. Those were his interceptions on the season. He didn't throw another interception after that game. I mean, absolutely incredible. You'll love to see that. He's easily the best athlete at the quarterback position in this draft. Top to bottom athlete overall in terms of what he can and can't do. Um, Four six is about what his projected dash number is. Uh, he does struggle under pressure from the pocket. He's not the most comfortable guy in the pocket. He is very comfortable once you get him out of the pocket. And as we all know, the NFL is shifting away from just being a pocket passer dominant league to being able to be mobile. So that bodes well in his favor. Uh, reminds me a little bit of a of a young Josh Allen in terms of wanting to make plays. There are sometimes that Josh it, that Josh Allen we talked about this all the time tries to make too many plays when he should just let things come to him. Justin Fields, at times, gives me a little remnants of that. It's, I feel like he's trying to force plays to happen when he should just take what comes to him a little bit more naturally. And then, study habits on the field. This is some of his decision making. You think it, I would think if his study habits were a little bit better, and maybe if he was a little bit better preparer for games, film study, things of that nature, though some of those concerns may go away. There was the tweet that he made about how he worked harder and prepared harder than me and people are like oh that's such a bad thing i think that's actually a good thing i think it shows that he's learning and growing and being mature and understanding that there are things that he needs to improve i think if he can continue to do that it's going to bode well for him as a quarterback because as we saw in the playoff this year they looked pretty darn solid mm -hmm. number two on the big board should be of no surprise mr zach wilson now that you know that fields is at two at three for me excuse me uh, Zach Wilson is one that is kind of jumps off the page in terms of arm talent for me. Uh, he is someone whose completion percentage has gone up. Uh, first year was 65.9% completion percentage all the way up to 73 and a half. So almost mid 70s. You love to see that. 33 to 3 touchdown inter to interception ratio in 2020, which is an absolutely phenomenal number with a short and condensed season. He's obviously an elite arm talent. He can sling the ball all over the place. 
479 projected 40. Um, the, the, the concerns with, with Zach Wilson are obviously the level of competition playing at BYU with some of the teams. I don't think it's as big of a concern or a question as with Trey Lance. And he has played some, some solid teams in college football and performed well against those teams when faced them. Um, there's the, the questions around his drive to be great and his ability to deal with adversity. Um, they, they talk about and bring up his background a lot. A lot of people do. I don't think it's as much of a concern as people are making it out to be. Um, you do, no, no matter where you're at, the drive to concern is, is an issue if you have something some something along the lines of what happened with someone like a Tate Martell, where he got to places and people got thrown and obstacles got thrown in his way and he wasn't able to su succeed. Zach Wilson hasn't had that issue. Everywhere he's gone, he's found a way. Everywhere he's been, he's found a way to excel and exceed and grow and improve as a player. You can talk to anyone at BYU. They seem to love his character. I think he's a great, a great, a great player and a great guy. And I don't think he's going to have any issues. The big question is, is can he win over an NFL locker room? I think that's a that's that's a big question to ask. The game is changing. If there's these questions about him getting out and about and around, that may set off some people in NFL locker rooms if they think he's a spoiled rat, a spoiled little whatever boy from BYU's never done. That may take that may make it harder for him to win over a locker room. Um, I don't think that will be the issue. I hope it's not the issue for him. And I hope that people stop just sp screwing around and spouting out bad nonsense because you make it harder for these guys, once they get to the NFL, to establish themselves and connect with people because you've put out a narrative that may or may not be true about a guy. Um, and then the last guy on my big board, what a big surprise, Trevor, Trevor freaking Lawrence. Yes. Uh, yards per game increase, uh, 219 to 244 and 304 over his last three years. Completion percentage increase 60, 65 to to high 60s, so mid 60s to high 60s in his three years, which is incredible, especially with the volume and the number of passes he throws there at Clemson. 15 career interceptions to 86 career touchdowns. You like to see that. Um, no real major concerns with him. He can succeed around less talented rosters is probably the only question I have if, if there are are guys who aren't, if he doesn't have as much talent at the receiver position or at the offensive line, can he still succeed at a high level? Um, and it's easy to lead when you're successful, so I think some questions that are going to pop up are, can he be a leader in a locker room um, with an organization that has been in turmoil? Uh, if he ends up going to a place like Jacksonville that has been front office drama, player drama, can he find a way to get that locker room to to mold and be cohesive immediately or in a short amount of time those are all reasonable questions but i don't think those are questions you ask um about whether or not you take him number one overall i think those are questions you ask about whether or not he's the face of your franchise as a rookie he may eventually be the face of your franchise but he's definitely going to be the quarterback of the future no matter what so that's my big board right there guys i like to see it there you see at the bottom there kyle trask and kellen mond are two guys i'm also fond of they do have some weaknesses and some other issues and we'll i'll talk about those in another episode later but the big board right there you'll love to see it trevor lawrence at one all the way to trey lance at five gentlemen thoughts yeah i, I think that you have made up so you know, made some good points and you brought up a lot of numbers that show definitely the positives about each of these quarterbacks they're all very good and very talented it's kind of like you know you're just picking and choosing certain things that you like better about each guy I think all of them have a place in the NFL. It just depends on where and what situation and what scheme they're going to fit into. Um, and some of them are going to have a lot of pressure early and some of them aren't. So that'll be the interesting part when we get into the draft is just who goes where. Yeah, I think it's super interesting with this group because you have the guys, you know, the very mobile guys like Fields and Lance and Lawrence actually isn't far behind. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have, you know, um, you have Mac Jones, who's your traditional drop back guy, and I think it kind of depends on who your offensive coordinator is outside of Trevor Lawrence. Trevor yeah. Lawrence is the number one guy, but once you get outside of him, it almost depends on what scheme you run, who you would prefer among the right. other four guys, because they all, obviously no kid comes out of college perfect, but they all exceed, they kind of all ex excel at different things. Yeah. So it's kind of an interesting group. There's not really um, one guy that's super, maybe Fields and Lance are kind of similar, but with, even with them, you have Lance played FCS football. Mm -hmm. And so, and Fields played at Ohio State, a premier FBS program. So it's kind of an interesting situation. Absolutely it is. And now we got the game. 
Yep. Your turn, your time, sir. It's my it. turn. <laughs> All right, we're going to start out with number five, and I'm going to say that Trey Lance, or I'm sorry, Mac Jones is the number five guy for me. Um, I just, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, things that hold him back. There's a lot of things that he needs to improve on. He is the uh, pocket passer. Not sure if the pocket passer thing really is big in the NFL anymore, which makes me ask questions. And also, where is he going to fit? I see him as a game manager in the NFL. I think that uh, the talent around him would have to elevate his play. So he's definitely number five. I like what he did, but one crazy thing about him was he didn't throw any tight windows this year. In fact, only 43 passes that he uh, were into tight windows that he completed. That's not very good. No. Joe Burrow last year had over 130. So that'll just show. And they were already criticizing Joe Burrow last year for the same thing. So that makes me wonder. Um, I, I know it shouldn't be a knock on him because his talent was there. So he made the plays that he needed to make. I just wonder if he is really an elite quarterback or if he is in another year a second or third round pick. But for this year, he'll probably go in the first round. Um, but he doesn't, I mean, as far as the film goes, he does make reads and he's a good pocket passer enough to put him in my top five, not enough to move him past these other guys. But at number four, I have Trey Lance. I think that the arm talent and the, and the ability that he has in the right situation with the right quarterback coach, the right offensive coordinator, they could develop him into a player. This is a guy I don't know if he can start day one, but I think that a year, you know, a year or two down the road, he could be an elite quarterback in the NFL because of the talent. Um, you mentioned Josh Allen earlier. I think that is the mold that you're looking at here. I'm not really worried about the talent that he's going against. You know, you had Carson Wentz that came in against similar talent, and he had success until this last year. So I think there is, you know, something there. My, my main concern with Trey Lance is he doesn't come off his first read. He's not a guy that goes through progressions and make reads. And I'm sure the system he's in, it was probably told that, you know, maybe one, two, read half the field and then scramble. Uh, but he's definitely not somebody that goes through progressions and make reads, which is scary because on film, I've seen him stare down receivers the entire time. Also, he just didn't throw very many passes. Um, he would look and if it wasn't there, he would just run. He didn't throw into tight windows. Uh, he would force balls um, occasionally, but he didn't throw any interceptions. So that's a good sign. But I think that he's somebody that needs to be developed. He's not somebody that you should put in day one and start. He's not your Justin Herbert. You know, he's somebody that needs to sit. And the, prob the problem is he's probably going to go to stupid early. Oh, yeah. I think he's going to go in the top ten. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think so. I don't think he makes it past Carolina at probably eight. Not. And, you know, that's what's going to be crazy. Um, at number three, I have Justin Fields. Um, coming into the season, Justin Fields would have been my number two quarterback. But now he's going to be number three. I like his athletic ability and his size. I think he reminds me of Cam Newton that way, but I think he's got a better arm than Cam Newton. I was a huge Cam Newton fan coming out of college, and I, I like Justin Fields, and I think if he gets into a good situation, he could be a solid quarterback. I question sometimes, because we didn't always get the play that we got in the playoff game. Mm -hmm. We got that type of play the entire season. Then I think that it would be a real question whether it's him or Trevor, Trevor yeah. as the number one guy, and it's really not. But the film tells me this guy is a top 10 talent. So I'm definitely going to have him on my list. And I think that he has the ability to be a big-time quarterback in the NFL. The athletic ability is going to help him. Um, he's got that kind of that, that wiggle when he runs, and he can get out of a lot of situations. He's big and strong and fast. Um, he does go through progressions, not to the level that Mac Jones does. I think Mac Jones is better than uh, Trey Lance and Justin Fields as far as going through progressions. This is another guy that reads half the field. This is this is the Colin Kaepernick syndrome, where you read half the field. If it's not there, you run. And I think that developing into a big-time quarterback in the NFL, he'll have to learn to get to progressions three and four. If he does, then he'll be successful in the NFL. If not, they will find a way to beat him. They will blitz him. They will pressure him. They will Tua Tagovailoa him, and he will be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and that's how you go from looking like a top-10 talent to being a bottom third of the league quarterback. And I hope it doesn't mm -hmm. happen to him because I like Justin Fields. He's a good dude. Yeah. I loved him on QB1. Mm -hmm. We got an insight into him as a person. As far as the number two guy, this is probably, I mean, besides Trevor just being so talented, Zach Wilson's my favorite quarterback in the draft. Yeah. I love this guy. The, the arm strength, a lot of people question it. I like the way the ball explodes from his hands. Um, he makes good reads. He's very decisive. He did have a lot of clean pockets. Uh, but he does have the athletic ability to get out. 
um, but he always looks comfortable in the pocket. I know there are concerns about him off the field, which I'll get to in a second, but on the field, he's an elite talent. Yep. There's a reason this guy has jumped up the boards. I think that when Steve Young talked about him, he's right. This guy is a big time quarterback and he will be in the NFL. And I think that somebody's going to get a just a huge elite talent. And I think he's going to elevate to another level. I think this guy could be a pole bowler in the first three years. Um, somebody's going to get a win here. This guy, the, the part that people talk about, about kind of the arrogance and the cockiness is the part I think that makes him a great quarterback. Now, the question about off the field, there is a story. I've watched interviews with him because I wanted to answer some of these questions. This guy lived with a teammate in Southern California so he can train. And he refused to take food from the, the family because he didn't want to put out the, the mom. You know, he didn't want to make her do extra. So he would always go buy burritos and noodles and stuff like that. Doesn't sound like a guy that's taking advantage of people or that has concerns. The way that his teammates talk about him is glowing. I think people are trying to make something out of nothing. They're trying to put this guy in the Johnny Manziel area, yes. and he's not Johnny Manziel. It's one thing to be very confident in your abilities. It's another thing to be arrogant and cocky. This guy is confident. This is the same confidence that Aaron Rodgers had coming out. They are similar that way. And they're different in talent, but similar in the, in the mindset and stuff. That's why he's got to be number two. If the 49ers could get him, I would be in on that. You mean to tell me there's a chance he could slide down boards to 12? Well, let, let's hope. <laughs> let, let's, let's really hope that people really care about his character concerns. Care so much <laughs> about those character concerns for real. Yeah, and my number one guy, of course, is Trevor Lawrence. Oh, it's not Kyle Trask. No, it, it's oh, definitely okay. Trevor Lawrence. Uh, I have been a huge fan of Trevor Lawrence since he was in high school. I was watching high school uh, film of him before. You know, I watched him uh, go to the Nike camps and all that. He, this guy is a fantastic player. He is the prototypical quarterback with a size, speed, um, just arm strength, the way he has great vision, he reads, he's good, he can take a hit and get up. His teammates react to him, he is a good leader. This is the kind of guy you build a franchise around and right from day one, no matter where he goes, he's the face of the franchise because he is the most well-known player coming out of this draft. Trevor Lawrence will be marketed huge, and then I think he'll go and show up on the field. It he's I don't know if he's going to be elite right away, but I will almost bet if he depending on what team he goes that he starts getting talked about like we talked about Justin Herbert and those guys as one of the you know uh, premier quarterbacks right away in the NFL. And I think within two or three years he will be top ten. So you guys are taking a look at my top five here. Just to kind of go through it again, it was Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, Trey Lance, and Mac Jones, one to five. And that is my quarterback list. And I don't know if the quarterbacks are going to be there for the Niners. <laughs> it's so sad. It's so sad to think that's, that it, it is. It's not even that it's not possible. It's entirely plausible. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the question is going to be who is going to fall. If you guys are right and Trey Lance is the fifth quarterback, Trey Lance, you know, might be down there. But Horst, Alex has Trey Lance five. Who do you have five? Because I had Mac Jones and he has Trey Lance. Um, I also have Trey Lance Woo. fifth. Um, there's a lot to like about Trey Lance. He's um, he's a big, strong, physical, <laughs> fast guy. He's uh, his numbers in his one season he started at the FCS level were dominant. He had 42 total touchdowns to no turnovers. I mean that's incredible. He's he runs well, he moves well in the pocket, and he's got a special type of arm. So I mean those things are really in incredible about him. But the problems that I see with him is that one he was dominant in the FCS. Two. North Dakota State is the Alabama of the FCS. They churn out guys that make the NFL. Not, not, tur not turn out. Churn. Churn. Churn out. They're, for an FCS program, they do. Um, they're constantly one of the two or three most talented teams in that level. So there's a little bit of questions that the teams he was playing against were overmatched. I also agree with him that when I watch a video of him, he tended to look at one guy and not take his eyes off him. And 
it's one of those questions that, like kind of people have with Mac Jones and Devontae Smith, where his receivers just better than the defensive backs they were facing. I don't know. Um, the other thing that scared me about him was when he does run, he doesn't have, he described uh, Justin Fields having wiggle to him. I don't see that from Lance. And I saw, I've seen him several times lower his shoulder into oncoming defenders. Yeah, I know that might work at the level he played at. He's a big cat. I don't care about size and weight. You lower your shoulder into an NFL safety as a quarterback, and eventually you're going to get hurt. There's guys like Tyron Matthew that's, what, 180 pounds? Ty you lower, try lower your shoulder on Tyron Matthew. See what happens. Don't You're going to get whacked. Trey, don't do it. So that scares me a little bit about him. But I do think he has all the tools. If he's coached correctly, taken by the correct team, he could be the second or third best guy of this group when it comes out at the end. But right now I have him fifth because of the concerns I have. And they're not all his fault. I mean, it's not his fault. It's that where he got recruited to and played, and he made the most of it. Right. Okay, fourth, I have um, Mac Jones from Alabama. Um, he, the pros about him are that he's accurate. He's got good footwork. He's got good technique with everything he does. He reads the field well. Um, he's, But once again, just like Lance, but even at a higher level, he, I mean, the four main receivers he's thrown to in the year and a half he's starting are first-round picks, top 10 picks, top 15 picks. So, I mean, and then how many of his linemen are going to be guys that get drafted in the first two rounds? Most of them. Good chunk. So, oftentimes their opponent was overmatched with talent. Now, it's not, once again, not his fault that he was on a really good team and he used the talent around him correctly. Correct. So, but the thing that I don't like about him is his arm is only, to me, his arm is only above average. It's not, he doesn't have a special arm. He doesn't, he's not supremely gifted in any one way. I think he's smart, but I think with him, he's one of those guys that I think his floor is very high, if that makes sense to people. He's, he's not, I don't think he'll bust out of the league in two years. At worst, I think he's a guy that sticks around as a backup. He's an agent fringe starter for 10, 12 years. Yeah. But I don't think his ceiling is very high. I think you're going to get what you're going to get from him. And that's not always great when you're talking about a rookie player. Is this ceiling Alex Smith? I think that's the kind of guy I compare him to is Alex Smith. I think that's perfect. Because he's, he's a guy you want to be good, but you're just like, mm, when you watch him. Yeah. <laughs> true. Um, number three for me is Justin Fields from Ohio State. Um, him and Trey Lance actually have a lot in common in that they're big, they're fast, and um, they have strong, accurate arms. My issues with Justin Fields is that um, he he doesn't take checkdowns very often. No. He he will sling it into he will trust his receiver to make a play, and while that can be a good thing. It can also be a negative thing, especially the higher level of football you get to. Mm -hmm. Now, um, his arm is special. He has special arm talent. And he probably has the most physical tools of any of these quarterbacks. But he um, he also doesn't do a great job of throwing guys open, like throwing them before they make their cut and expecting them to be there. He kind of waits until they are open, which his great line and great players around him at Ohio State allowed him to do. If he tries to hold on to the ball that long in the NFL, he's going to get eaten alive by the defensive lineman because no one's line is that good. No. And so he really needs to work on that is expecting guys to be open and putting it, the ball in a place where they're going to be, not where they are. Right. So, But he's another guy, if he is coached correctly and puts his head into it and works his hardest, might end up the could end up the best guy of this group. He's that talented. Mm -hmm. Um, my number two guy is Zach Wilson from BYU. Um, Zach, they, you guys have kind of gone over his strengths. He's got plus arm strength and plus accuracy. His it's kind of when they talk about a pitcher like a Randy Johnson or one of those guys, how the ball just explodes out of their hand. You see the same thing with him when he throws a football. It's impressive. And you can all you've also seen him throw all the touch passes, all the he can make any throw on the field. 
He's got good footwork. He's mobile in the pocket. He's not necessarily a great runner, but he's mobile around the pocket and can extend a play. Aaron Rodgers type mobility. We're not talking Lamar Jackson mobility, but he's he can move around. If we're talking 15 years ago, he is an athletic quarterback. Correct. But yeah. Now they're most of them are athletic. Um, his negative is that he's sometimes a little overconfident in that arm strength and tries to thread the needle a little too much. Um, he could get through his progressions a little quicker. He, um, but you know, this is kind of nitpicking on a guy that's a top five player. Um, he could he could do to hit the weight a little bit. He's a little bit undersized. He's could do to get a little bit bigger and stronger. And then, like you guys have both mentioned, his he's a very confident guy and it can borderline on seeming arrogant. Um, like you said, after watching interviews and stuff with him, I, I don't think he's a bad kid. I think he's confident, but what great professional athlete isn't very confident. So I don't really think it's a negative unless he takes it too far. But I don't see, like you said, I don't see any signs of Johnny Menzel or, you know, right. one of those guys, Ryan Leaf or someone like that that was too arrogant and didn't oh, run over his locker room. Poor Ryan. <laughs> hey, you know what? Ryan Leaf's a changed guy. Okay. Yes. Um, and then my number one, shockingly enough, is Trevor Lawrence. And why did anyone take Kellen Mond? Really? You know, I, I'm so um, shocked. With Stunned. Trevor Lawrence here, he mentioned it a little bit. He's one of those guys that's been on everyone's radar since high school. He is almost a LeBron James type prospect in that he was a, for hardcore football fans, he was a household name before he went to Clemson. True. He's that type of prospect. He's 6'6", 220. And I mean, he might even be heavier than that now. He looks a little heavier than 220 to me, but he's supposed to be able to run under a 4'6 in the 40. Um, when you watch him run, it's so smooth. He's the way he strides out and gets out in front of people. It's really fun to watch. Um, I'll, I'll list through the pros I have here for fun. Um, game experience, size, mobility, speed, arm strength, arm accuracy, making correct reads, and winning. Okay, the only cons I have on him is that one isn't his fault, is that his talent around him was tremendous. But once again, you cannot blame a player for using good players around them. How it's dare silly. you? How dare you go play at a um, school? Number two is that he did struggle a little bit in a couple big games when his line did not play well. He, um, you know, struggled in the face of pressure. And for the teams we're assuming have the shot at drafting him, he is not going to have a plus O line in the NFL at least the first year. So he is going to have to get a little bit better at that. But outside of those couple things, I, there's not much wrong with him. I mean, he's one of the better quarterback prospects in the last 20 years. He's an Andrew Luck, John Elway type prospect coming out of college. Yeah, I think that's the very, very true point, Horace. And now we got to ask the question, guys, because we don't know what's going to happen in the draft. You never do. You never know where people are going to draft. <sighs> not only wh which one of these guys could fall to the 49ers at 12, but also... It, would you trade up to get one is another question. But also, which one of these guys fit the 49ers system and who would be we be willing to have come to the 49ers? Because I don't think we would want all of these guys, but I think there are certain guys that fit. Alex, who would be a guy that you would be willing to make sure that you get if you have to make a move to get a quarterback? I think the big thing for me... Man, it's really tough. It's really tough, and we'll get rid of those guys because those guys definitely aren't on the list to trade up for <laughs> at all, not no. at all whatsoever. Um, the, the big one for me is Zach Wilson. I think Zach Wilson is the best fit in the scheme for us and what we could do and what he could be. I think some people, I've heard some people talk about how Mac Jones, Mac Jones, Mac Jones, pocket passer, play action, all that good fun stuff. But the problem for me is, is that if you're going to trade up or if you're going to draft a guy that's supposed to be the future of the franchise, he needs to have a higher ceiling than the guy you currently have, and he doesn't have that. He doesn't have a higher ceiling. His ceiling may, his ceiling, Horace said it best, his ceiling may be Alex Smith. It could be Jimmy Garoppolo's one good year of production. Could be that. Maybe. But it ain't higher than that. There's no way it's higher than that. Zach Wilson, for me, I feel like is the guy whose ceiling is potentially the highest. And the reason for that is, is because we all know Trevor Lawrence's ceiling is generational talent. It's potential future NFL Hall of Famer. 
Zach Wilson's could be that as well, but it's not that right now. I don't think people's ceiling is generational talent for Zach Wilson. It's potential to be more than what he currently is or what everyone believes he could be. I think the the mobility for him is is a, a big thing. I think that's a big plus for him. I think his arm talent is underrated. I, I think people don't appreciate how well he throws the football and the fact that he can make the, the, the types of throws that he can make. And I think of the guys on the list, he's the one that, yes, he's getting a lot of talk right now and run right now. People are, are talking about Zach Wilson. He's starting to become a more mainstay figure in the conversation, but he wasn't. And that may spook some people and make them think, that ah, maybe we're putting too much stock in this guy and that he could fall. If he gets past five, I think the 49ers are having serious discussions about how can we move up to get this guy. Um, because I think if he if he falls out of the out of the top five and into the six seven range, you can get in, get somewhere in there and trade up. I don't think you have to give up too much to go up six spots in the draft in order to get him. And I think they should pull the trigger and do it. Yeah, I think that if Wilson Fields or Trey Lance get anywhere near the number seven spot, the 49ers will think about making a trade and moving up only because you know with Trey Lance, you know that he will have to sit a year probably so you're looking at Jimmy Garoppolo playing quarterback another season for the 49ers Trey Lance developing I also think that would be similar to what the Panthers would do with Teddy Bridgewater have Trey Lance come and then Teddy Bridgewater be the you know the bridge the stop gap until you get that going uh if Justin Fields falls I know that he's not a Kyle Shanahan type of quarterback Kyle Shanahan didn't want RG3 in Washington and he doesn't really go for the athletic guys but this guy is a guy that completes passes at 70 percent and he's a guy that can uh, make plays with his legs. He's a very talented guy. He's somebody that as long as Kyle believes that he has the right mindset and mentally able to handle his offense, because that's the key. These guys have to be able to handle that offense. He can help this guy um, develop. And this guy does have a higher ceiling than Jimmy Garoppolo does. Mac Jones does not have a higher ceiling than Jimmy Garoppolo does. The only way I could see the 49ers taking him is if they traded back and then he still landed there, which could could happen he could possibly land there but i think that at 12 the only guys that they'd be willing to take are wilson fields and of course trey lance and if your guys's uh lineup is right and mac jones is seen above trey lance there is an there is a possibility trey lance could fall all the way to 12. he could fall further than that do you really think someone would take mac jones in the top 10. no but i i don't know if if mac jones makes it past new england uh, that's, yeah, that's the big thing. But you never know who these guys are going to fall in love with. True. Look at Baker Mayfield. The Cleveland Browns fell in love with him, took him number one when he was not, you know, seen as number one. Kyler Murray would have, you know, a lot of people thought late first round, he goes number one. So it all depends on what you're falling in love with. I think that the problem is going to be with Zach Wilson is I don't know if the Jets will let him get past two because... Well, if he, cause if he, gets, if he gets past two... There's a lot of teams, run teams there that could take him to, to be the guy that's behind. But if he also falls past two, they they may be thinking to themselves, he could end up at 12 in San Francisco. Well, I think that LaFleur will know what Shanahan's feelings are mm -hmm. on Wilson. And if he goes two, that's part of the reason. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. He's the guy, to me, that's worth trading up for. I, I know everyone wants to see Trevor Lawrence in San Francisco. That's not happening. You're gonna have to give him way too much to get that pick. It's not gonna happen. Who knows? But <laughs> future episode coming. But um, <laughs> but the realistic option there, I agree with you guys. If uh, Zach Wilson starts falling down into the five six range, I wouldn't be too shocked to see a move up for him because he's he seems like he fits everything Shanahan wants in a quarterback, and he's a special arm talent like we all talked about. But yeah, I don't. Mac Jones, I wouldn't move up for. Trey Lance, as long as you know that he's not ready to start right away. True. Um, and then Justin Fields. I don't think Justin Fields makes it out of the top five. I think he's too physically gifted. One question I have for you guys out of these five quarterbacks, besides, well, I guess besides Trevor Lawrence, because there's no chance. Would one of these guys actually be a better option to win this year than Jimmy Garoppolo? To I'm not win. gonna make that statement. Uh, That's on Lawrence. I, I don't know if I. Here's the thing: is I don't. I don't know if I can because. Uh, 
I still have, I still, while I like, I love Zach Wilson, I love Justin Fields, I still have questions about their ability to make certain types of reads. And Shanahan's system is not an easy to easy to digest system. It is fairly complex. There's a lot going on. I know he does scheme a lot of guys open, and there's a lot of times where you come off a of play action, and there's just the dude you're supposed to throw to, and that dude is standing in the middle of the field with nobody within right. 20 feet of him. But that's not every throw. That's not every play. And as great as Kyle Shanahan is, that's asking a lot to do for a rookie quarterback is scheme a dude open every time so he has less reads to make. It is the NFL. Teams are going to figure some something out on you once they have tape on you. So I would say, other than Trevor Lawrence, no. I don't think there's a guy that I'm 100% confident with that can get us to the Super Bowl right now. But if I had, if you put a gun to my head and said, you have to pick one, who do you think? It'd be Zach Wilson. Yeah, the, the biggest problem is it took Jimmy Garoppolo a couple of years to get you know comfortable with the reads and the system. So asking a rookie guy to learn the system that fast and be able to execute at a high level is a big task. But we've seen that these other quarterbacks that the 49ers have with lesser talent were able to help the offense and move the ball. So maybe one of these guys could. I, I'm with you. I think Zach Wilson is the only other guy that can do it. I would rather him be able to learn the system, especially for five, six games. So if that if that was happening and they were to draft Zach Wilson, I think by five, six games into the season, he'd be ready to take over. And I think at some point during his rookie season, he would be a upgrade over Jimmy Garoppolo only because he can do more down the field and take more uh you know great make more great plays i think jimmy is excellent he has a quick release and those are the kind of things that he does he operates well in the system but i think outside of that he doesn't offer a lot to the 49ers as far as athletic ability playmaking ability but zach wilson does do that i agree there it is. You heard it here for Zach Wilson to the 49 trade up and get him a super early. No, but in, in all honesty, Zach Wilson, a guy that we're, we're yeah. really high on, we like. Obviously, Trevor Warren's top of our board as well. Uh, let us know what you think in the comment section down below. Did we miss a quarterback? Should we have been bringing up somebody else? Did we dis not include somebody in our top five that we should have? Let us know in the comment section down below. And while you're down there, make sure you like, subscribe to the page, hit that notification bell. That way, you get notified every time one of these videos goes live because from now until draft week every single tuesday at 5 30 p.m pacific standard time one of these ranking videos is going to go up that's right every single tuesday you're gonna get a top five list from us uh, from us on our pre-draft basically mock list who are the guys at the position that are the elite guys number one on our boards at that position all the way down to five we're going to rank and we're going to tell you what you think every tuesday make sure you're here hit that notification bell you don't want to miss this content and as we get into these other positions there's going to be guys that make a lot more sense for the 49ers and we're going to be able to spell it out for you we're going to make sure that you know who makes sense for the 49ers and who doesn't so that way you're not having to pay attention to all the other players Let's focus in on who makes sense for the 49ers scheme and what they're trying to do building for the future. Yeah, I'm excited. We got a lot of stuff to do to go over here. Um, I love college football. I love watching college football. So getting to watch extra college football to scout these guys is fun. Bingo. It's going to be a good time. All right, guys. You know what time it is. Let's chalk another one up.